And Aldo is so thrilled to be able to celebrate his 87th birthday with you. One of the things that happens when you live as long as Aldo has, 87, um, is that you have a lot of opportunities to make wonderful friends. And so he, there are friends here who have followed Aldo through, throughout his life from the very beginning of, uh, uh, with his nephew who's come from Washington. We went to his favorite uh, used bookstore, and, and we were walking by this, uh, let's just say, like a Victoria's Secret lingerie club, uh, and these two bottles came out and, and took his picture, and the, the picture's over there. And Stefanos, who made sure that Aldo lived, because it was Stefanos who, 20 years ago, or 15 years ago, said to Aldo, Aldo, there's something wrong with your heart, and I'm going to write to your doctor and make sure he checks. And that led to Aldo's open heart surgery and the fact that he was saved because he had an aorta that was ready to burst. So we, we really, and not only did he do that while he was walking in the Lower East Side in New York, Stephanos drove here, and this is what a friend is, to sleep on the floor the night before Aldo went into surgery. But I'm not a poet, I'm a physician, and I look at his legs, I'm like, Aldo, your legs are really swollen. He's like, yeah, I know, but the, uh, the medical students at Harvard said I'm fine. I'm like, I, I don't know if you're fine. <laughs> so, so I tell Aldo, okay, when we're done with this New York thing, this was with our research of surveillance cameras, you need to get back to Boston and get yourself an echocardiogram. And uh, Anna set that up, and I get a phone call a couple of days later, he's like, Stefano, they're rushing me for surgery. But I, I have this thoracic aneurysm, it's about to burst, and it's far out. <laughs> they painted me orange. At this phase of our lives, um, we've started uh, an Aldo Tambellini Art Foundation to preserve his work, to promote his work, and then the third goal was Aldo's, he said, to make money available to young artists just like I was who needed it and never got any help. So that's going to be really the focus. And we've been helped in that focus with, uh, by Wendy, <laughs> Wendy here and her husband, Nick, uh, who, are, um, who are part of the foundation. Wendy is the development person. Nick is going to help with the finances. Joe's going to be on the, on the board. We're hoping to have some of his poetry that we'll pre-record with him, because obviously his health is the most important thing now. So um, maybe we'll get into opening night, I don't, I don't know, but hopefully we'll be able to record some poems with him and have them used as part of the text. And we're also using his fabric, his lumograms and fabric that we've had made for costumes, and we're doing masks with his work and making a big difference, you know, between the captains, the Montague, the black and the white, and it's going to be very exciting. So we're starting a new phase of Aldo Tambellini, and then there's a whole family of poets, and Tantangi is here, um, having started with Aldo in the Liberation Poetry Collective, and having 15 years ago, I think, right? 17 years ago, and uh, uh, publishing books, and now uh, looking for a new anthology, and because it's, um, because it's Poetry Month, we've decided Aldo wanted to have a poetry reading. So you're going to be hearing some poetry of Aldo's and other people who have come with their poems. Um, so I can only tell you that we have been truly blessed by each and every one of you. And my life has been blessed and enriched because I've met probably the greatest person of the 21st century and 22nd. I grew up with Mussolini uh, dictatorship and uh, he occupied Ethiopia and and uh, and and and, uh, and and other and other area near Ethiopia and so I was uh, the image of black people were very familiar uh, there was there was there was not a propaganda against black like it is in America the way I grew up. Uh, it's, it's very hard for me to understand 
why this obsession in America against black people. I find it very crazy. I find it totally insane. And anyway, I have been a friend with black people uh, for many years because the people, see, after the, the, after the, the American bombed my place because it was under Mussolini, so it was the American who were absolutely trying to liberate the Italian against the Nazi because the Nazi were alive with, the, with Mussolini, but Italy was like split, split in a half. There were people against Mussolini, there were Italian against Mussolini, a very complicated a, a history to come from because you could have people that you knew that were pro Mussolini and you have people that, like my grandfather, my mother, I grew up with my mother's father and my mother's uh, mother and, and uh, my grandfather was a socialist and he was beaten up by the fascists that gave him castor oil in order to, to, to go, they, they would go to the bathroom a lot and, and, uh, and he never spoke about Mussolini. So there was a lot of division among this thing, you know. But Mussolini was very popular, it was very popular. And uh, my brother was very conformist, and I was not a conformist. I, always, I was always a little rebel right from childhood. I only had one brother. And uh, then, then the American bombed my neighborhood. And miraculously, I survived. 21 of my neighbors got killed, I remember, that day. It was the day of the Epiphany, January the 6th, 1994. I was, I was uh, 13 and a half, I was. Uh, so I moved in the country, my aunt who was also born in, uh, in, in Brazil, and then the German and the Nazi took over. So I have a very kind of interesting background, and uh, I'm very against war. And, and then, then the, uh, the people, the American troops that liberated us from the Nazi were the Buffalo Soldier, which were the American black soldier, who were liberating the Italian from Nazism, at the same time, they were, they were segregated when they were coming back to, to Europe. So the fact that I remain very politically involved, mind-wise, it's, it's natural to me, in other words. You know. My brother did not do that. I was kind of different. Uh, kind of different. So uh, I, I always, I went to the Washington March, I remember, you know, when Martin Luther King made, made that famous speech. I always been pro-integration of people. I think we are all human beings. We are all under, under the same skin, uh, all the same kind of background. We're just different races, and that's the way the world is made. In other words, you know, there's also uh, uh, Oriental races, Arabic races. You know, and, and if we get educated enough, we realize that we are not the only dominating race. You know, is the white race and. Uh, so I have a special connection uh, with, with the idea of, of integrating or something. Uh, I know a lot of things are better, or some of the things are, some of the things are kind of crazy, and some of the things are better at the same time. But we are known in a very good situation, politically wise, with, uh, with Donald Trump. Well, anyway, thanks a lot for coming over today. Yes, I know. It's a new Dante Hell's Vision. Play with Fellini Mass Media Circus. Performed by the virtual Insane Asylum cast. It's a mad holographic act inside a global big top, unpredictable chaotic order. It's the, it's the evil ringmaster of injustice with draconian dead to the laser beam vision, ruling the circus with unchallable power. It's a horror side show and the aging of useless clown, the tame lion grazing on genetically modified sterile grass growing from sawdust in the arena. It's a Jerry Springer morality play, the dull acrobats with alluring eyes seducing libido with corporate pimps cashing in. It's a Goya demon suspended on the tightrope. It's a tiger tamer, stiletto heel and blade, bloody fingernails snapping a domination whip in the air. It's a Frankenstein in artificial intelligence by a lab, rewriting brain outdated all controlling ships. It's a remote robot rat spying over the ringmaster. Get in line, buy the ticket, see the show. The future is right, the price is right.
This is July, uh, we, June 7, 2016. He wanted to crush the atom with his fist, program his willpower to throw the planet off orbit, consume the star flame with into ashes. The world was not big enough to control. Slavery had been a boring hobby. Exterminating the surviving roaches offered no more challenge. Power. The world was the, the obsession. His glance could hypnotize an alligator, turn the ocean into a desert, burn all forests, starve all animals. He wanted lava to, to, to fill the rivers. He owned a nuclear arsenal and all the gold. Power. In his madness, he devoured parts of his own flesh, bleeding and drinking his own blood. Hallucinating of being the king of the universe, he died an early death, beaten by his own pet, pet viper. His last word was power. This is February 6, 2015. One, they can hang from a tree a black butterfly or imprison the wings when they're ready to fly. They burn the night feeling the black, its blackness. They obstruct this astronaut way when walking in black space. They obsessively hate all that is black. Two, to try to inflate a paper machine globe, they draw blood from an ordinary turnip, they shop on a used brain at the, at the Goodwill store. They have a two-way conversation with an amoeba, amoeba. They crush the world with their fist into a worthless matter. Anything is possible. It's a matter of mind when, when he is dreaming of power. All right, thank you. Bride to Arts Manifesto. <laughs> Phantom Knights bring Anna to her confessional. As a broken microphone upon the priest's chest, broadcast by accident the confessional of Anna's love for Aldo. An anonymous rebel of Syracuse sits in the back of the church, dressed in black, unknown to the younger Anna and to the world both much younger. Lost in teenager eternity, deep within sleep, longing. Black shadows of film project upon the street, and people dress in black like Aldo did when his spirit exited time's gravity and met the teenager, Anna. Anna points to a wall, a projector, and projects a Byzantine mosaic, glass broken, burned, of a departed upon glowing dust cooling to black. Sculpting into moments, Anna's approach to the altar electric, a bride to art and prepared to worship. Hand holding hand, vortex, tornado, spins of memory of past lives all at once, skin upon skin of past lives awakened. The Morse code secrets of lovers, candle burned hand holding hand, his name tattooed upon her soul, a rebel from Syracuse. Oh my God. I have a lot of respect for Aldo. Uh, uh, the way he was, a, he was able to, to challenge the, the establishment, the US, the, the New York, uh, specifically, specifically the New York establishment, uh, as son core defender. As a core defender, you don't, I mean, in French, you don't do something against your own good, against your own account of sacrifice. And I appreciate that. Uh, and uh, we, 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 we formed together, uh, uh, Aldo and I, a, a few poets here, uh, uh, including Gwenda uh, Walcott, who's here with us. Uh, uh, a collective called the Liberation Poetry Collective in 2001 and uh, we have published uh, two anthologies this was this is the second one liberation poetry an anthology uh, it, there's about a lot of poets about more than 50 uh, there's a 50 but uh, and a lot of poets you know, some of them are famous and non-famous 
Well, uh, I'm going to read a poem in, uh, in honor of this great event uh, to celebrate Aldo's life. Um, I, I, I wrote a poem. I think that's the first time I'm going to read uh, this particular poem. It's going to be part of a, my next collection of poems. It's going to be my third book. In, uh, I'll write in three languages, French, Haitian, and, and English. This, uh, this one's going to be my third uh, all-English uh, collection. Uh, the poem, uh, is called the, uh, the Emperor's Last Speech, uh, watching Donald Trump's first address to the Congress on February 28, 2017. Necessity makes the man, we say, back in our country, a huge meteor onslaught is coming his way, the signs show. And his speech and prayer tone carried the night for the court gallery. The ritual was a perfect volume for everyone these past long weeks, trapped in the Sado Majo schist roller coaster of manufactured screes a la Steve Bannon to bring about new vanesque relation for the, for the deconstruction of the administrative state. The emperor, the emperor indeed had closed that night. His great night brimming in the spotlight of the fatherland and the herd applauding and looking around for recognition in Helen, the smell of power. He had a tough week, the emperor. His mastery gaming of facts and reality and he's, and he's mixing them with the eternal world has taken a blow from the people's enemy. A part of me salutes that witty scheming of materialistic essence of void and nothingness, although void with financial prowess. The decorum was, perfect, was a perfect hidden shield for such a tormented soul that even hell itself might refuse. And yet, I salute him for having gained power, not through the establishment shoulders, as had his loving, hating body, the Kenyan, but through the debasement, the debasement of all the, of the whole tribe. I salute his courage to resist virtue. Necessity makes the man we said, the emperor accomplish more than even he ever thought his privileges would afford him in normal circumstances. If I could, if I could do that, I can do this. That's the logic. The Minister of Injustice indeed has talked with the all eyes great empire from the East as did the emperor's son-in-law and plethora, and a plethora of thick double agent and avid sycophants, and all the amateurs of the of this serie noir movie acting under the guidance of the commissar. My heart bleeds for the refugees, the migrants escaping horrors of civil strife, in war of domination. My heart bleeds for the exploited, underpaid, undocumented workers entangled in the trap, turned by the emperor's eyes. My heart is saddened for the people of this great land of hope and revival. May the probity that guided in the past a time still illuminate the path to tomorrow. State affairs are no comedy, no game. Real people suffer every day in silence on the other side of the spotlight. 
May the Republic's ideas save the day. May human, may human kindness survive this debasement of our values and all that is dear to us. May the madness of the privileged caste be a simple asterisk of all. There's more to life than appearance. Also exists the new lady of the poignant moment. Hope burst in the ashes of whom happening. The other lost in the inescapable jungle. Necessity makes the man, we said. Many centuries of searching for liberation of the soul from the regiment of the plantation, from the factory's conditioning of space, from the military's impulse to control and kill, from society's measurement of what counts, should not last in a moment of folly and caprice. The emperor's first speech was his last word, script in the well-behaved teleprompter. He was his only real claim to glory in this land of past, of fast passing forgetfulness and remem a remembrance. The emperor's fate will be well deserved, as that of all tyrannies in the world. Still, I miss, I will miss his hobbies. Is herbis in motherfucker, motherfuckerness? <laughs> is herbis in motherfuckerness? The emperor has said to his pal, to his pal, why do you think we are so innocent? Such, such utterance enhances his appeal. For once, he tells his people the truth. Should this land? About his, at once he at once he tells his people the truth about this land he surely knows so well. This is one more reason we will miss the emperor. And a few days later, early in the morning, he sounded alarm that he was illegally surveilled uh, by his non-American Kenyan predecessor. Nobody, only just a few, believed him this time around. He was now proved a person was word, was words one cannot trust. He now joined the twilight of, of the, the twilight pathway between the crazy demagogue and the calculating idiot. The emperor may go or stay, but life here will never be the same. He may choose to retreat to Mar a Lago early in the morning after a last tweet. He may decide to hold the around like the amusing ghost of the town. Still, we all should ask every day. Every day is out there tweeting and talking. What is really up with him? The emperor is real, as are his artifices and antiques, as are the sufferings of the people. His children behind his fake common fear cannot absorb his unleashing of hatred and fear. We will have passed as a simple memory of time if we fail to grasp what societal madness looks like in real time. Thank you. Oh. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. Followed in your footsteps once back in the traveling days. Somewhere I failed to find your trail, I'm still stumbling through the haze. But this killer's on the highway now, now I'm stuck out here in this town. Wait a minute, I skipped the part. I followed in your footsteps once, back in my traveling days. Somewhere I fail to find your trail, I'm stumbling through the haze. But this killer is on the highway now, and a man can't get around. But I sold my soul for wheels that roll, now I'm stuck here in this town. So come back, Woody Guthrie, come back to us now. Swing along. And, yeah, right, right. Tear your eyes from paradise and 
rise again somehow. If you run into Jesus, maybe you can help him out. Come back, Woody Guthrie, to us now. It's a delight to see a fine gathering of friends and uh, neighbors of Aldo on his birthday. The credit, of course, uh, needs to be given to Anna and other friends who have decorated and arranged this event. <coughs> and what an impressive cake yep. and cookies from Betty. But I stand here uh, before you to express my pleasure and good fortune to have enjoyed over a dozen years uh, the warm friendship of a brilliant and sensitive artist and a man of uh, good humor, uh, kindness, and political activism. It is my proud privilege to uh, greet Aldo and honor him with an angavastram, befitting a person of his stature. You know, in the ancient kingdoms uh, of uh, South Asia, such as the Sangam uh, rule in the Tamil Nadu coast now, Chola Mandalam, there was a tradition to honor artists and poets and uh, scholars, you know, by the state, you know, and with uh, nice scarves uh, with gold and silver. I don't have all that, but I have a very fine scarf with some gold in that. So I thought that's the best I can uh, present. And I'm requesting our poet, uh, Mr. Askia, and uh, Alan Sarot to come here and join me offer this to this oh, great and kind man. If I get the I could wear it as a sorry. Yeah, right. Yeah. True emperor. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> now, I'm not going to make a point of what I'm in the danger. Thank you, but I That is so wonderful. That is Askia, while you're up here, would you find out? Reading now? Beautiful. Askia and Aldo knew each other in New York in the 60s and then found each other again. This is called A Man in Old Fatigues, and the subtitle is The New England Center for Homeless Veterans, Court Street, Boston. I saw him on the street, a man in old fatigues, with switchback eyes that see where he has been, right, left, left, right, patrolling his minefields, a hidden, shabby, homeless-seeming man, old soiled news in cigarette-stained hands, a thing held like armor, clutched like a shield, though useless to protect from or withstand, invisible, straight hits to soldier's creed. Do not admit that enemy called fear. Get real. Your enemies between your sights. That's what war requires, what you're here for. Across a gulf, I wondered, infantry, hot jungle fights in rain and mud, high nights, hands twitch, eyes flinch, mind stuttering at war. Immigration's next. It's called English as a Second Language. And there's an epigram from Genesis. My son's tunic, a savage beast devoured him. Another December, cold fingers bared, yearning branches scrape glass at wind's whining insistence, in, in, as if wanting to winter among ivy, cacti, and flower-burdened begonias of my potted garden on a marble-top table once my grandparents and before theirs my grandfather's sister, whose husband, even in the depression so rich they bought a grand hotel's auction spoils 
until in that bitter season the market fell and he to leave her something, anything, fell too. Fleeing pogroms, the poor, the poorer, observant and atheist, men and women, greeners all, sailing dreams. For them, English was a woman with a crown and a torch on a postcard. They traveled wet, sickening sways to reach. Among them, my grandparents. His first language was Russian, hers Hungarian. The language they met in was hope. A son, then a daughter, and English the language of home. English not always correct, sometimes for her, laughing, a lilt, a bite of Yiddish, but only among members of the tribe. Elsewhere, a whisper, mouth to ear, ear to mouth, not to be found out. Their second language, the language of dreams, for their children was second nature, lingua franca, its irregular tricks, not the traps they were for their parents, until one word choked like stone, pneumonia. The doctor knowing nothing could be done, delaying, a son, in three December days at 21, dead. Habits of grief differ. For my grandmother, agonist furies at God's crime, God's treason, treason, forever on her tongue. For my grandfather, unspeakable to outlive a child, the son born in America. Those winter mornings of the depression, Monday to Friday, my jobless grandfather, brown Hamburg and brown coat in place, a nickel the price, faced movies rather than his son's death, knowing his daughter, college-educated secretary, made the nickels where slots were made. Bowed by his wife's, wife's grief and sickness, stiffening with his own, evenings he walked home through dark streets paved with shaken leaves, wind blown down, trodden what once was gold. Do dreams have ghosts? Eventually a grandson, then a granddaughter, but the children's mother, deceived, divorced, got, chose it, got guilt. They all live together, the shoe blistering. <clears throat> The old man from Russia sat at solitaire, <clears throat> excuse me, QXR in his ears, not his wife's tirades, not his daughter's needle clicking, needles nick, clicking knot after knot in the smoke of her cigarettes, night after night. Their language not Russian, not Hungarian, not English, silence. Thank you. based on the fact that the flower, the life of the flower is very short, but in the short period of time, the flower gives so much to the environment, like fragrance, nectar, mm -hmm. um, and still uh, uh, before dying, is like his life had been worthwhile. So it's, uh, it's called a dialogue between a flower and the bird. Bird asks the flower, why are you so happy? An insect will come and suck all your nectar and you will shed all your petals soon. No one will remember your existence after a few days. Thinking of your mortality, I feel scared to open my petals. The flower replies, listen my dear, I know I will be no more after a couple of days, but I am not scared to die. I enjoy smooth touch of the wind. I love the way sun brightens my petals and I love the way insect kisses me. All these joys are enough. All these joys are enough to keep me happy for the moment. Although these joys are not everlasting, I am giving my nectar happily because 
Sacrificing my life on someone will make my life worth living. Fate of life is death. So I am enjoying my moment of happiness. I advise you to live in the moment because nothing is everlasting. So open your petals and be happy like me. Thank oh, you. It's beautiful. <laughs> gotten out of the military, out of the Air Force, and I had this crazy idea that I was going to be mirrorless, like uh, Diego Rivera, Rasco, Saqueros. I was going to paint the walls of Africa because I felt that our story had been so distorted in the West. So Boy Scout that I was, I was, <laughs> I was, uh, going to the Art Students League of New York during the day and working in the factories of Brooklyn at night. So uh, I met this very fiery uh, artist, sculptor, sage. And the first thing he said to me is, are you surviving? And I told him what I was doing. He said, are you insane? He said, you're going to burn yourself out. And so what he did very graciously is uh, link me up with uh, artists in the neighborhood, people in the neighborhood, and uh, I began to, I worked at this, set me up to work at this gallery. And so I left the factories and began to work in the galleries and therefore managed with Aldo's gracious help to survive. Uh, I didn't think Aldo was going to survive because <laughs> Aldo was confronting the whole artistic establishment in New York. <laughs> and I said, they're going to shoot you or something, you know. <laughs> he told me, he said, listen, if you don't want to stand for the people of the world, he said, give it up. So that's kind of, you should have seen him in those days, you know. <laughs> So he didn't, he's, he's just older, he, he changed. You see, he wanted to sit down and talk to him, you know. If anything, maybe his wit has gotten more darker and sarcastic. Uh, yeah, you uh, talk to him sometimes and uh, see what he thinks about Herr Trump, you know. I think we have. Yeah, you think? <laughs> uh, I'm reading a couple of pieces, short pieces. Uh, that the Huffington Post they just did a thing on me and I guess the establishment wants to know that they know I'm still around <laughs> and so uh, it's a uh, fact this month's Huffington Post and uh, first of all I'm going to read a short piece to uh, the beautiful forces of nature and of course, in harmony with our great mother earth, uh, I uh, recently read this with a beautiful dancer. I don't know if you all know Wyoma, the uh, dance mi uh, mistress or not, uh, at uh, the Gardner Museum, I guess about tw two weeks ago, uh, when uh, Esmeralda Spalding and uh, her colleague appeared there as the main divas. This is called Wind Chant, a diva profiles. She was wild and fresh, a breeze from forever blown across frontiers of my life. Her whispers were soft spring breaths, stroking leaves guiding them towards fecund maturity. I was rock unbending, hopelessly rigid, but she found secret depths, emerald valleys glowing in her mind. Wind and rock, yin and yang, her golden voice sang in dark infinities, was sunlight where green reigned supreme, in mythic landscapes embracing summer. My beautiful one, 
a hurricane sweeping the tropics, filling us all with emotion, insurgent devotion to all that surges and surrenders, sings and embraces totalities, emerges clean and whole to perpetual rhythms, alive in melanin rims where lost voices haunt recurring dreamscapes, and spirits resurrect full moons forever, Eden. <laughs> See, uh, corporations are called us uh, demagogues, so I thought I'd read a more arty piece to you. you know. This is to uh, the great master Miles Davis. This is the more uh, gritty aspect of America, ghettoistically speaking. Miles Beyond 2000, a final elegy for Miles Davis. Quote, jazz is finished. We better get it together, unquote. Miles, 1975. Driving through America's neon graffiti, one remembers Miles' furious quest, a master discipline, fiery determined, a man zealous, powerful, elegant, forging a creative epiphany in depths few quote, quote, squares could imagine. This fierce genius immersed in the fluidity of grace a dark, griot mind exploring depths of inner space and time, so marginal in his magical paradigm, blazing like a nuclear sun. Miles, who created new essence and rhythms via great black voices, orality beyond Puritan morality, unleashing apocalypse. A prophet seeking visions past bluesy, quote, style, collapsed beneath the ferocious genocide of dollarism. Anglo-imperialists scheming to blast our Harlems into myriad free-fire zones among Dante-esque infernos. So how would life flourish within this nation of poets, shouters, screamers, when the blue song fades in urban gulags, and only primitives remain among its echoes. Who would we be then? What ancient agony withered though essential awaits in bleak silence, spewed with crack pipes, condoms, glocks, and the shock of recognition among nameless, faceless spirits writhing in the dust. <laughs> Askia and Aldo and I met at the same time. Um, on the Lower East Side um, in the early 60s. Um, we realized that we were part of a renaissance. Um, and I, I feel so fortunate to have been born in the time that I was and to see the changes that um, we contributed to and raised our voice f for um, the good <laughs> and the right of the people. Um, and so this year, I know, like for most people, has been very agonizing with uh, what is happening politically and <laughs> with the horrible um, monstrosity <laughs> that is now at the head of um, the government. Um, and I also, I feel, I felt a lot of resentment 
towards the complacency that allowed this um, history to take place. Um, and when, when I see people talking about uh, moaning and groaning, I, I can't help but say, you guys let this happen. <laughs> um, and it's important to go back and remember the work that we were part of and that history does go in, in cycles. Um, so, I ha you know, I have to pinch myself and remind myself of that. So, on this occasion of Aldo's birthday and the birth of spring, I'm um, happy to read this uh, first poem. Let me find it. I knew I was going to do this one. It is. A sun love ritual for primal people. I was about to give up on spring. I was about to accept that it would be cloudy and cool forever. Then you sneaked up on my horizon. Your warmth startled me. You were the sun, all golden and new. I found myself laughing. I turned toward you as most living things do. I basked in your light. I was playful, like my ancestors coming out of the cold sea. I wanted to sing about you to have festivals of thanks for your warmth. I danced around you in ancient rhythms of love, swirling, leaping, spinning, with my arms outstretched and my face upturned. I got lost in the sunshine of you. The drumming of my hard black heels on the soft brown earth roused other spirits. Women who had loved through the ages, they laughingly joined the dance. We raised such a pregnant din, we conjured up flowers and vegetables and life. The male gods became jealous and claimed you as one of their own. They warned, give too freely of your fire and the women will grow strong enough to destroy the universe. You believed them and then narcissistically hid yourself. Narcissistically hid yourself. I'm dancing a slow, stunned dance now and humming softly to myself. My sisters are drifting off to rest, but they each stop to kiss me gently and to remind me that spring does come again and again, and that there is always a new sun that is as compelled to shine on us as we are to gaze at it. Yeah. Oh, there you are. <laughs> have my glasses on. Um, I see him. I see him. Skia, I was struck by the first piece that you read. Wind chant. Yeah, because don't, don't you feel it's in the same kind of rhythm and imagery as the poem I just read? Uh -huh. yeah. You know. I, I was a dancer 
just the other day. Is this a new board? Is this a new one? Is this no, a new no, this actually, I wrote this in 77. Uh -huh. um, still adds, asking the same questions, but also getting um, answers. Um, so anyway, I, I was a dancer. Dancing was my life. <laughs> so, like, it, I just found it really interesting to reflect on a skier's choreography that, that I saw as I was listening to his um, poem and how much, how similar the, the, two, the two poems are. Uh, I think so. But uh, the, 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 the great yeah. African American poet, Anu Ibaka, said he was so impressed by Askia's musical, the way, the way you read the music. <laughs> okay. Um, All right, we have. Um, because she has to wrap up. Yeah, he's there. He's right so, over there. I have to give everybody a chance. Okay. So, actually, I'll stop there. Oh, okay. I, I, right, I, 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 can, I can stay here. I'm the one that interrupted that because um, uh, we love, if I may, I just got a message for Aldo. So I need to, I would like to read this. Um, if if uh, my emotions and my eyes will, will allow me. It's a message for, for Aldo and you'll know who it is that's writing to you. Aldo, I'm deeply grateful that I have you to look up to. It's so easy to feel overwhelmed and dis disheartened in New York City, to get lost in the mix and forget who you are. But being able to learn and be guided by you in such a gift is such a gift, a guiding star in the darkness. My art is so important to me, but there are times when it feels so precious or fragile. It's hard to believe it will endure, and again, knowing that you continue to work and create is such a comfort. You reassure me of the importance and power of art, and that that is truly a gift. As a young artist who is still finding their way, I couldn't think of anything more helpful than a mentor like you. It's truly a joy to know you and a blessing to be able to work with you. With so much love, Holly. And Holly's, Holly's picture is like the one that's bent there. Aldo did a performance piece with Holly and that's the first time he really, he met her. What she did was, she got into a pool with this gigantic black inflatable, and the beauty that she is, she swam at night. Aldo projected film um, onto the water and had even a drone flying over taking pictures. So that's how we met Holly and Wendy, her mom, and, and Nick, her dad, the lucky parents of such a wonderful and talented young lady, so we're very proud of her. So we would like to thank CCTV, perfect timing, correct? The staff and, and the people at CCTV who are so involved with the community that once they read the request and, and Aldo's bio, they, uh, they really decided to come and, uh, and take this. So we, so thank you CCTV.